Good morning and welcome to this Corny and Lind webinar. Uh, my name is Joe Swin, I'm with the business development team. And just firstly, I just wanted to thank you for joining us and uh, taking the time out of your morning to uh, this presentation. Uh, today's presentation is entitled School Arrangements with Related Charitable Entities, uh, Tips and Pitfalls. And it's being presented by uh, Nina Brewer, who's a senior associate here at Corny and Lind, and Andrew Lind, who's a director here at Corny and Lind. Uh, before I get into um, introductions, um, I just want to go through some quick bits of housekeeping. So first up, uh, we're making a recording of this uh, presentation. So if you have to, if you get pulled away from your desk for any reason, um, you can come back to our site uh, partway through next week, and the recording will be available to you there. Um, secondly, in the bottom left-hand side of your screen, there is a chat box. Now, if you have questions as the presentation goes, um, enter them in there. Now, do be aware that everybody will see the questions that you ask. Um, but yeah, I'll flag that to the presenters and they'll either answer that in line or, um, or, uh, or there'll be some time at the end as well for some more questions. Um, so yeah, recording is going to be made available, so that's uh, lots to look forward to next week. Um, so today's presenters are Nina Brewer, who's a senior associate um, and is a member of our school law team here at Corny and Lind. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Laws from Bond University and a Graduate Diploma of Legal Practice from the Queensland College of Law. Um, she works particularly in commercial and corporate law and not-for-profit and charity law, so lots of different areas that um, are to do with school arrangements um, and Nina's got uh, plenty of experience there, so lots to look forward to there. He's also got a Master's of Christian Studies from Regent College, Vancouver in Canada, and he's the chair of the Queensland Law Society Not-for-Profit Law Committee and a member of Regent College, Vancouver in Canada. And he's the chair of the Queensland Law Society Not-for-Profit Law Committee and a member of the Law Council of Australia's Not-for-Profit and Charities Committee. So two fantastic presenters today and I'm going to pass you over to Nina now. All right, thanks Joe. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us on this Friday morning. Andrew and I will be presenting um, on this topic school arrangements with related charitable entities um, and we'll be giving you some tips on how best to manage these arrangements and as well we'll also be pointing out some pitfalls um, that we have seen in our practice um, and our experience with schools. Now most schools have affiliations um, of varying levels and complexity with other bodies or entities. The most common one that we see is a school affiliation with something like a local church or religious denomination. Now there are also other arrangements which schools have, um, for example, with community groups um, or with other charities as well. Um, these affiliations um, in my practice, they most commonly take the form of a shared land use arrangement or a lease or a license um, or a loan. There are of course other arrangements that schools can strike with other entities um, and we'll be touching on these as well in this presentation. Now these arrangements, um, obviously there's a lot of legislation and a lot of regulation around that, so schools sometimes find themselves um, with a bit of an issue. So it's imperative that schools and their governors approach these with care and that they're aware of what their obligations are around that. So what I'll do is just move to the next slide. Um, and I'll just set out today's agenda just so you know where we're going. So what we'll be talking about first is we'll be talking about a bit of a big picture arrangement. So setting the scene, if you're a governor, what are your obligations? What's the legislation that applies? And what are the big ticket items that we're needing to think about and comply with? Secondly, we'll be touching on um, boards of directors. So they're the, the body that is responsible for the day-to-day -day management um, of the entity that they're on the board of. So it's very imperative for them to be aware what their obligations are and what questions they should be asking when they're facing the decision of whether to um, strike one of these charitable um, arrangements. And then what we'll be touching on in items three and four is um, just some common arrangements that we see and some big tips and traps um, that we think that you should be aware of. So we'll be touching on firstly leases and licenses and then com other commercial transactions, which, which is a bit of a catch-all. So we'll dive into it. Uh, we'll go to setting the scene first. So governance duties, um, schools that are registered as charities, many of you would know they have to comply with the ACNC governance standards. Now these standards are a set of core minimum standards that deal with uh, how charities are run. They're found in the ACNC regulations um, if you want to have a look at them. It's imperative that governors are aware of these um, and are familiar with these and know what their obligations are under those governance standards. So these standards, um, in a big picture, they require charities to remain charitable, operate lawfully um, and you to do their charitable work. Because these governance standards are quite high level and they're not precise, charities are able to decide exactly how they will comply with them. Governance standards are quite high level and they're not 
precise, charities are able to decide exactly how they will comply with them. So I'll just run you through the governance standards. There will be um, yeah, two that are really quite relevant in today's webinar. So the first standard that charities have to comply with um, is their purposes and not-for-profit nature. So charities have to be not-for-profit and they have to work towards their charitable purposes. Um, and mainly, they have to be able to demonstrate this objectively and be able to provide information about their purposes to the public and to the people that they're accountable with. So you'll hear this requirement to be not-for-profit thrown around a lot in today's presentation. The second standard is that they have to be accountable to their members, so they have to take reasonable steps to remain accountable and provide members with an ad adequate opportunity to raise concerns about how the charity is governed. Uh, the next one, obviously, they have to comply with Australian laws. They can't commit a serious offence um, or breach a law. The next standard is that responsible persons, so when you're talking about companies, you're talking about the directors. When you're talking about an incorporated association, you're talking about your management committee. Um, charities have to take reasonable steps to be satisfied that they're responsible persons um, and not disqualified from managing corporations and that they're they're adequate to be running the charity and they also have to um, remove any people that they, in their reasonable opinion, don't think meet these standards. And the last standard is the duties of responsible persons. Now this is the big one that I'll just be um, pausing on for a second and expanding on. So all of these standards are important but this is the main one. So the duties of responsible persons, this is then set out into another subset of standards so I'll just pop them up on the next screen. So first of all, they have to act with reasonable care and diligence, um, or just of the charity and for its purpose. So that's just one to keep in mind um, that you'll see is relevant soon. Um, the next one is they can't misuse misuse their position um, and or relative. So that's just one to keep in mind um, that you'll see is relevant soon. Um, the next one is they can't misuse, misuse their position um, and or relative. So for example, um, putting up a sham lease arrangement where there's actually no and or relative. So for example, um, putting up a sham lease arrangement where there's actually no uh, objective reason for that arrangement to be in place. The next one is they can't misuse information um, obtained by virtue of being um, a director um, for their own personal use. The next one is they, they have to disclose any actual or perceived conflict of interest and we'll, um, we'll be talking about this a little bit more when we talk about the board as well. Um, the next one, again, this is, in my opinion, this is also a very important one when we're talking about these charitable arrangements, is that they have to ensure that their charity's financial affairs are managed responsibly. So as a minimum, they should have good processes and procedures and policies in place to prevent problems and to manage money responsibly. And of course, we want a paper trail um, of the money that is spent as well. And the last one um, is they can't allow the charity to operate while insolvent. So you'll see um, if you have a lot of experience with companies that these um, lean quite heavily on the director's duties in the Corporations Act. But of course, this doesn't apply just to companies. Um, it applies to any entity that's also registered as a charity. Uh, Nina, just a couple of comments from me on these governance standards. Of course, these governance standards take the form of regulations under the ACNC Act. Uh, so they do have uh, statutory standing. Um, additionally, uh, if they are breached, um, um, the consequences um, are that the ACNC regulator uh, can uh, become involved, assuming the charity is a fed federally regulated entity, which it normally will be as a company limited by guarantee. It may not be if it's part of a, a church structure. But nevertheless, even if it's not a federally regulated entity, a breach of the governance standards can, in ultimate terms, uh, lead to um, a charity being deregistered as a charity and losing its tax concessions, um, quite apart 
from the reputational damage uh, and uh, other remedies that might be uh, available against the particular officer that, that uh, breached duties because the the governance standards are, uh, are not the uh, start and end of governor's duties. Uh, governors also owe duties uh, at common law uh, quite apart from the governance standards. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. All right, now what we'll move on to next um, is the next set of requirements that um, companies and other entities that are registered as charities uh, need to be aware of, especially if they're um, obtaining government funding for their non-government schools. So the main legislations um, that we'll touch on is the Australian Education Act 2013, so that's obviously the Commonwealth legislation. And then there's various state-based legislations. Now we can see that we've got attendees from Queensland and New South Wales today, um, so we'll be focusing on those two ones. So the Queensland Act is the Education Accreditation of Non-State Schools Act 2017. Um, and this act was amended in 2017 after a prominent school funding case that brought to light some timely issues regarding these inter-entity arrangements. We'll be doing a case study of that shortly as well. Um, and then there's the Education Act 1990 in New South Wales. Now that was amended in 2014 before um, the, the prominent case, however it still does um, have some operative clauses which are imperative in these arrangements as well. So I'll hand over to Andrew to give us a bit of a rundown um, on how these legislations interact. Okay, thanks Nina. Um, the, so what we're going to talk about um, in a little more detail is um, the legislative um, framework in Queensland and New South Wales as it relates to some of the preconditions for recurrent funding uh, in those jurisdictions. Um, so in Queensland, um, Section 77 um, uh, talks about eligibility uh, for funding uh, on the basis that eligibility criteria uh, are met. Uh, so that begs the question uh, about what the eligibility criteria are. I'm glad you asked. Um, here's, uh, they're set out in Section 10. Um, they include um, that the school uh, must not be operated um, for profit, or another way of saying that is it must be operated on a not-for-profit basis, which is what, which is the language the, the New South Wales uh, Act uses, but both have the same effect. Um, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, it, the um, Queensland Act talks of, uh, creates a uh, prohibition on the entering into of prohibited arrangements and we'll unpack what they might mean. They're particularly important in related, in related party transactions. Um, and then there's some catch-all provisions uh, which haven't been fully tested yet, but I think the day is coming. Um, um, in Queensland, the catch-all is um, uh, that a degree of connection between um, the school entity and another entity uh, that could be expected to compromise the independence of the governing body of the school. So, for example, if the school board uh, has a number of board members who are also board members of the church board, um, the church board um, members, when they're sitting on the school board, uh, are not there as representatives of the church. They're there as school board members and they must act um, uh, without fear or favour, making their decisions in the best interests of the school. Um, I get very nervous when I hear language that, um, that says that, uh, well, uh, the church appoints the school board members and the school board members do what we tell them to do. Um, um, and, it w and that's, it's not normally that black and white, but if there's inklings of that occurring, we've got a red flag uh, being raised and we need to be careful. Uh, we'll take the next slide. Um, the Queensland Act in Section 7 talks, of, uh, unpacks in a little more detail what the Queensland legislation means by being operated for profit. Um, effectively, 
that is satisfied if, if the profits are used for any other purpose other than the advancement of the school in question. Um, so for example, if we've got profits being siphoned off to a parent religious body, um, well then um, it is the school is being operated for profit. Um, doesn't mean that um, all the board members' uh, personal uh, pockets are being lined necessarily, that's another issue, uh, but the language in these acts about for-profit and not-for-profit is effectively to prohibit a school from uh, moving, stripping assets or income out of the school to another uh, entity not for the advancement of education through the school. Um, uh, prohibited arrangement uh, in Section 8 um, effectively is an arrangement um, uh, on a non-arm's length basis that is not for the benefit of the school. Um, so non-arm's length means uh, we've got related parties. Related parties are normally given by um, elements of common control. Um, so that in a school entity, that could be indicated in a number of ways. A, um, a school which is a, uh, a ministry of a church, uh, the control could be that the church could be the sole member of the school entity. Uh, the church could appoint, as the sole member, could appoint the board members of the school or at least uh, of the school board or a quite a number of them. Um, even if it's not the whole board, the church might have uh, a power of veto or needs to consent to who, who, the, who the board members are. Any of those sorts of arrangements will mean that <clears throat> the school and the church are related entities and they're not dealing with each other um, on necessarily that they create us creates the question about whether they're dealing on arm's length terms. Um, then um, we ask the question of what is for the benefit of the school? Um, and we then have, so we go back one slide please, Nina. Um, we ask the question about whether the arrangement is at market rates. Um, so if we've got related parties, the bottom line is, um, that uh, the arrangement has to be at market rates and on market terms. Um, and we'll talk some more uh, through a case study about what that means and how that might be applied uh, in your circumstances. I will take the next slide. Uh, this is an emerging risk um, disorganisation. Um, uh, for all the best intentions in the world, we have related charities uh, wanting to uh, uh, help one another in getting a school going uh, and operating. Um, and we're seeing a number of uh, matters that are making their way into our firm uh, where the arrangement is so disorganised and undocumented that the risk is um, that uh, in Queensland, the allegation could be made that because things are so unclear, how can that be uh, for the educational objectives of the college and how can it satisfy uh, the uh, market rates test uh, mm -hmm. if there's no independent written evidence of the market value of the transaction being entered into. In New South Wales, um, the statutory language that could be offended um, is if the um, arrangement is unreasonable in the circumstances, having regard to the fact that the fin that financial assistance is provided for the benefit of the school. Um, reasonableness would require um, that arrangements are reduced to writing, that arrangements, if they're between related entities, um, are market tested and there's written evidence of market value um, and that if there's governors involved that have conflicts of interest that those conflicts have been appropriately managed um, when the decision to let the contract uh, or, enter, or enter into the arrangement uh, with a related entity 
um, when the decisions by the governors are taken in relation to that arrangement. We'll talk about managing those conflicts shortly. All right. Case study. I'm talking about this, am I, Nina? Yep. Okay. So this is a series of a number of pieces of litigation involving the uh, the Malik uh, Islamic School uh, from 2006 uh, and following. Um, um, the most uh, recent uh, piece of litigation between the Malik Islamic School and the Department of Education in New South Wales was the decision of the that I'm aware of was the decision of the full court of the federal court um, in March uh, 2018. So it started it started with the um, AAT uh, administration and uh, uh, what is it? administration appeals. administrative okay. appeals tribunal. Um, um, then I think it went to a single judge of the of the federal court, and then it went to uh, the full court of uh, the federal court. Um, and now it's been uh, now the full court is saying, oh, then quite quite apart from that, um, oh, and the outcome of all those pieces of litigation was that the full court effectively upheld the revocation decision um, to revoke the recurrent funding of the Islamic school. Um, however, in the meantime, the Islamic school um, effectively tried to cure the defects that were occurring between it and the parent Islamic religious body by Litigating against the parent, so the, the parent religious body. So the school and the parent religious body then became unaligned and litigated against one another in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. The outcome of that was was quite surprisingly, in my view, quite favourable to the school, um, um, and therefore. Um, the school in the judgment of the full court of the federal court as between the school and the Department of Education, the federal full court of the federal court said, look, we now have this decision of the Supreme Court of New South Wales as between the school and the religious body, so school, go off to the Education Department and apply again for your current funding uh, and then we'll see where it all lands. So, look, at the end of the day, I hate to think how much money and distraction and sleepless nights, <laughs> um, uh, lost enrolments, reputational damage has been done through this through litigation that has been going on for years um, through multiple courts, um, and it's not finished yet. Um, the basis, the reason for all this litigation was that the, the the arrangements as between the Islamic school and the parent religious body, the Islamic Council, uh, were highly disorganised. Um, there were lease and licence arrangements where payments were being made uh, allegedly at significantly more than market rates. There were massive payments of uh, rent and licence fees in advance. Uh, so in, at one point, five years payments in advance, um, um, allegedly on the basis to help the Islamic uh, uh, parent religious body fund the acquisition of another piece of property. There were loan arrangements between the two bodies on um, that weren't uh, documented on commercial terms. There were management and service arrangements uh, between them uh, and big licks of money being paid by the school to the parent religious body with a lack of clarity about what, uh, what the payments were being made for and whether the services were actually even being provided. Um, and there was certainly a lack of board policies and practices uh, at the school level which would provide guidance to them 
about how they would actually make the decisions when the parent body came knocking saying we need a few million dollars for something we need to do. Yep. Um, Nina. I think there was also another issue that there were um, a whole bunch of church appointees appointed to the school board as well, uh, yep. which meant that the church essentially had the controlling vote on the board as well. Yeah, so there was there was questions being raised about who the real governors of the school were. Mm -hmm. um, was it um, uh, was it really the school board, or was it effectively the church board? Yeah. Uh, and the school board was really just acting as puppets for the church board. Yeah. Uh, so all of those issues are spilt into the public domain. Um, uh, and while there may be a happy ending uh, coming out of that, um, it's quite unhappy uh, in terms of the reputational damage and the cost and expense and distraction and emotional toll of uh, significant litigation and uh, and I, I would expect significant fractured relationships uh, between the entities in question. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Andrew, for that summary. Um, speaking about the board, we'll now um, have a chat about the board of directors and the questions that the boards should be asking when they're um, when they're appointing new board members and also when they're making decisions on these related entity agreements. So the first thing to think about um, is that we do need an appropriate skill mix on our um, on our boards, and that's one that really does go without saying to be able to um, appropriately appropriately manage the affairs of the company. So um, at a high level, you, from a school perspective, you might want to think about having educational, financial, um, legal, and property professionals on the board, but, but again, that obviously depends on the needs of your school and what the focuses of your school are. It's important that the, um, that the board is independent, um, and that's a really big one as well that, as Andrew just said, came up in the Malik Fard case. Um, they, can't, they can't be effectively controlled by another entity, and especially not an entity that the school's entering into an arrangement with. Um, so in our view, to the extent that there are other um, entities, entity members made up on a school board, it's permitted. Um, however, they shouldn't probably collectively have the majority vote on the board um, and they shouldn't be voting on those matters in which they're conflicted um, about, which we'll be covering in a second. Um, and it's important, it's imperative um, that if they are on two separate entities, when they're making school decisions, they have to be wearing their school hat. Um, and not their church hat or other hat, as the case may be, because they have to act in the best interests of the school only. Um, most of the time, um, as we can see in the next point, these people should ab abstain from voting on matters involving their other entity. Um, and it's important as well from a regulation perspective that regulators do have a clear line of sight to who the governors of the, of the school actually are, which is the board acting in the best interests of the school. Um, so conflicts of interest have to be very carefully managed if there are conflicts on the board. They have to be declared, they have to be minuted in a very clear paper trail um, and conflicted directors need to abstain from decisions as well. Um, and these conflicts have to be market tested as well. Yeah, yeah so look, just the, um, with the various boards I've sat on and many you sit on the council of, uh, of, of, of a of a school and have for a while uh, as well. And uh, our experience is that conflicts of interest is a, sta is a standing agenda item um, at, at the start of most board meetings, um, but it tends to be skipped past pretty quickly, um, like apologies and um, yeah. Conflicts of interest, no conflicts of interest to declare. Let's get on with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and you sort of it, it's there, but it's annoying, and no one thinks about it. Um, what the Malik litigation um, has demonstrated uh, for schools is that this is when when you've got related entities involved, particularly, this is get good record keeping in this regard is going to be essential. Mm. Um, that you actually pause when you get to that conflicts of interest section. If there are conflicts of interest um, coming up in the agenda that is being considered at that meeting, you actually declare them, you note them in the minutes, um, 
when you get to those items in the agenda, those directors who are conflicted absent themselves from the meeting. You record that in the minutes. You record the time they left. Mm -hmm. You record what was discussed when they were out of the room. You record the time that they re-entered the meeting. <laughs> um, and so that you know when the regulators, um, and it's not the ACN, it's not the ACNC, it will normally be the Department of Education or the Non-State Schools Accreditation Board, comes knocking and says, demonstrate to us how um, this is not a prohibited agreement or how this is not unreasonable or how um, this was entered into on arm's length commercial terms, um, how you've managed the conflict is a big element in, in satisfying your evidentiary burden uh, of saying that you, that you have not tripped over uh, any of those requirements. That's good. Um, the other take home as well in terms of an independent board and conflicts of interest is that if your school entity is essentially controlled by another body who would have the majority vote on the board, it's going to prevent you from recruiting and retaining um, some, good, some good talent um, because if they're outvoted by another entity on the board, they'll have all of the responsibility and potential liability mm. of being a governor of this entity but they won't have any authority um, to be making any decisions and they'll be at the mercy of the decisions that the other governors make and, and ultimately liable for those decisions as well. So you might be able to attract them but you won't keep them. Yes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you'll, you'll find them leaving. Yeah. Yep. All right, so as a director, um, what, what questions should you be asking when you're being faced with these decisions? Um, these questions should be asked about every transaction and resolution um, that they vote on and you know if, if you have the instinct that you feel uncomfortable about it then you should you shouldn't be voting on it. <laughs> um, from our experience um, in inter-entity arrangement these questions um, should be first of all is this in the best interest of the school? Um, again you'll see this correlation with the legislation and the case studies that we've been talking about. Um, the next one is this advancing education? Um, and I do note that advancing education also includes making money to do so. So a lot of our clients think that making money um, is not necessarily a positive thing, but what is relevant is what purposes you are investing that money into. So as long as it's advancing education, that's, that's okay. Um, next question, is this at market value, especially if a related entity or person is involved? Or if we look at it big picture, are we making this decision really in another entity's interest? Um, that one's a big one, especially in light of that Malik Fard case. Um, and the other question as well is, that's a bit of a sleeper, is does the board have to make this decision? Um, so especially when we're talking about, you know, does the board have to make this decision? Um, so especially when we're talking about, you know, some boards are faced with the question of should we be backdating leases or things like that. Um, do we do we have to be making this decision? Yeah. So you know, let's say um, the the lease or land occupancy arrangement between the church and the school is largely undocumented. Um, um, the the school governors after hearing this webinar say, okay, well we've got to get our house in order, so let's go and talk to the church leaders and get this sorted out. Um, and the church leaders say, yeah, oh, look, uh, yes, that's fine, we're happy to get it sorted out. But by the way, you've been paying under market rates for the last ten years. Um, we want to do a catch up. Um, you're now in a cash position to do so. Uh, so um, uh, we we'd like a lump sum or we'd like to increase the rent above market rates to catch up for the last 10 years. Well, why does the school have to do that? Is that in their best interest? No, it's not in their best interest. To, there's no contractual obligation to agree to that. Um, uh, however, if there might be um, if they've got no guaranteed long-term tenure. Right. It could be a, a relatively, they might have a pretty short fuse left on their tenure and the church might say, well, you want another 25 years. Um, the rent's now going to be X, Y, Z. Um, however, <laughs> um, it still has to be tested through the, the market value grid. Uh, but there is wriggle room in the market value grid. Uh, all 
then is right. Backdating is a big red flag, uh, but there can be, if it's carefully considered, um, if it's looked at in the context of what other arrangements are entered into at the same time, and putting them all within market bounds, there is there can be some ways of uh, of, of fixing um, some things equitably. Uh, but the, Nina's right. The, the governors of the school must say, must be saying, is this in the school's best interests, not in the church's or the other entity's best interests? Yeah. Good. Thanks, Andrew. So um, that's it on on boards. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, float them through. The next issue that we'll be talking about is a very common arrangement that we see in inter-entity rela um, relationships. So this is leasing and licensing from one entity to another. So I'll just go through a lot of the common arrangements that we see because you might very well have that in place in respect of your school. So the big one that we see is if a school is um, related or in close relationship with a church uh, where the church owns the land and leases or licenses it to the school. So if the school's operating on the land on a permanent basis, um, it will most likely be a lease where they enjoy exclusive possession. Um, if a lease in place, it's common. Yeah, so just, um, we've just noticed we've got a question from Chris. So yes, absolutely. Um, if you've got a question that you're happy for everyone else who's tuned in today to, to see, uh, you're very welcome to ask it uh, in the dialogue box um, uh, if you, um, uh, if, you, if, it's, if it's more, uh, if, it, if it's one that you'd like to be private, we're happy to take that offline afterwards. Uh, but yes, a general question, uh, very happy to take it as we go. All right, fantastic. Um, yeah, so if the school's operating on the land on a permanent basis, you're most likely to see a lease. Um, if the school's using the land, say, one day for, per week, for example, for a chapel service or something like that, um, you're most likely to see a license. The next um, common arrangement we see is where a school leases or licenses to, to a church. So where the school owns the land and leases or licenses it or part of it to the church. Uh, we see this commonly for new churches who don't have a permanent base yet. So for example, where they use a school hall on Friday nights and on Sundays for church and youth group services. Um, these, in, in my experience, they're commonly licenses, but they can be leases as well. And the other catch-all is that schools often also lease or license to other bodies. So, for example, community groups who want to use the school property um, on an intermittent basis. So, I've seen this include sports teams, counselling services, so using a classroom to provide counselling services, use of the school's kitchen to prepare food for the poor. Um, the list is, is very, very broad. Um, whether this is a lease or license, this one really does just have to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and there are, of course, other more complex arrangements that can, can come along with this. So one I've seen is where the church owns the land, leases it to the school, and then the school subleases part of the land onto another body. Um, but again, that's a very case-by-case -case basis. You'd have to have a look at the lease document or the license document to see if that's even permitted in the first place. So we've spoken about leases and licences. I thought I'd just give us a, a quick a quick class on what the differences are um, because these terms are thrown around a lot. So I've just put the three main differences up on the screen. So with a lease, you do, if you're the lessee, you get exclusive possession of the land. So you have the right to expel an unauthorised visitor. Um, so this means that the tenant, so the school, if you're, if you're leasing the land, um, has an action in trespass against the landlord if they enter the land without consent. Um, a licence, you don't get exclusive possession, so you, um, the owner is free to enter the land at will. Um, the next one is whether it's registered or not. So a lease exceeding three years can and should be registered in order to get what we call the protection of indefeasibility of title, meaning that the tenant's interest takes priority over other unregistered interests. Um, licences, on the other hand, they, um, they can't be registered. So the licensee just has a contractual right to use the land. And the last one, the last big ticket item, is that leases ex, um, exceeding 10 years, if it's only part of the lot that's leased, um, that is a compulsory subdivision. Um, licenses of over 10 years of part of a lot, is no, there's no subdivision there. So um, leases and licenses can be used strategically um, in that respect. Now I can see some questions coming through. 
All right, Matt, just keep going. Yeah, we might just uh, give a moment for someone to ask a question. Um, just on one comment from me on leases and licences is that um, I, I can't count the number of documents I've seen that are, co that are called a licence mm. um, but purport to grant exclusive possession to the licence holder. Um, um, well, in that circumstance, even though it's called a licence, it's a lease. Um, the problem with that is that um, if it's over part of the land uh, and it's for more than 10 years, um, it's probably a subdivision, um, which means then uh, that it's probably an unlawful subdivision in relation to which development approval uh, has not been obtained. Uh, and so there's probably um, various offences uh, under planning legislation um, that have uh, been committed by having the uh, arrangement structured in that way, uh, which might in turn uh, result in uh, consequences uh, under funding uh, arrangements um, um, about the unreasonableness or otherwise of the conduct that's been entered into. Mm -hmm. um, but look, I, I think the land occupancy between related entities is, is a big issue. Uh, most of our schools uh, seem to be alive to that. Um, uh, their long-term tenure arrangements, um, I think a, a school would generally want to keep at least 25 years of daylight in front of it in, in terms of its tenure uh, arrangements. Um, and, and here's the other little take home I'll give you. Um, the, there's no prohibition on how long a lease or a licence can be. Um, some people think that, the, the, uh, at least in Queensland, and I think it's the case Australia-wide, um, that uh, the longest a lease could be is 99 years. Well, that's not the case. Um, as long as it's a term certain, um, the parties can uh, negotiate uh, whatever they agree. Uh, we'll have a, one other thing to touch on in terms of long-term leases. Um, in terms of a new accounting standard that affects how you uh, record these things in your uh, in your financial statement shortly. Good. All right, thank you. Now let's move on to some tips and tracks in relation to leases and licences. So the first tip of the day that we're going to give you is where the school owns the land. So this is just where the school's the owner, not the other way around. Um, and if they're leasing, leasing or licensing to another party, the arrangement has to be on an arm's length commercial basis. So the conditions and the fees charged by the school to, I'll, I'll use the church as an example, so by the school to the church, has to be the same as if the school is leasing or, leasing or licensing the land to any other non-affiliated third party in the community. And again, um, evidence of market value is required in this sort of circumstance, so by a licensed valuer. Um, and the reason for this is because providing a reduced fee to the church, um, big picture, means less money for the school and this would disadvantage the school and benefit the church essentially. And the, govern the governors of the school, we remember, have to act in the best interests of the school. Um, and what it's essentially doing, Andrew might have some comments on this, is we're using government funding to benefit another entity or mm -hmm. if we're not using the government, government funding directly, we're using the school's portion of income that's not the government funding, which would be leaving a hole which the government funding would ultimately have to fill in the future anyway. Um, and this would be considered to be a prohibited arrangement, which will just take you back to the legislation. We'll remember that we have to deal with each other at arm's length and, and you'll see that I've put that in red, um, it also has to be for the benefit of the school. And that section goes on and provides some examples so an example of a prohibited arrangement is very clearly if we're leasing to another, um, if we're leasing from another entity at more than market value. Sorry, I'll, I'll um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Fantastic. All right, now um, it's a little bit different where the church owns the land and leases it to the school. This is where section eight really comes in: is that the school cannot pay more than reasonable market value for that. Um, our rule of thumb is that it should be a tick, just a tick under market value. Um, and the reason, again, that this works is the specific language used in this legislation. We can't be paying more than reasonable market value. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not advancing the school's philosophy and aims if we pay more than that. 
Um, all right, do you have any more comments on that one, Andrew? Uh, other than to say that um, um, if, the, if the school is, if it's an expense item for the school, um, the expense must be um, at market rates or less than market rates. If it's an income item for the school, um, it needs to be at market rates or greater than market rates. Yes. Um, so the church, for example, could decide to pay the school a little bit more than market to help subsidise the school um, if, it, if the school was a ministry of the church. Yeah, and in the same way, I guess, um, to answer your question, Corey, could a church provide a concession to the school? My view is that they could provide a concession to the school by allowing the school to lease at less than market rate um, if that is that, well, that, for that, the benefit of the school. That, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, but um, as long as the school is a ministry of the yeah. church, yeah. because otherwise the church governors um, are, are not acting in the best interests of the church. Yeah. Um, um, so that needs to be very clear in the govern in the constitution of the church that the school is a ministry of the church. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so some tips and traps again. We'll go on with this. So the first big ticket item is document the arrangement. Um, if it's not documented, absent an express demonstrable agreement, there will be a presumption that any rent paid under that arrangement is actually a, an advancement of a gift um, and not rent and not a loan. The other issue, um, I think we've already touched on this, so I'm not going to elaborate on it too much more, is that um, Mostly, we really shouldn't be backdating um, a lease because it's not in the interest of the school to do so. As Andrew said, there is always there's always exceptions to that. Um, so if you're concerned, you should be getting legal advice on a case by case basis if it is an anomaly. All right. The other um, the other question I'm going to pose, and I'm going to pose it as a question because I don't think we have a, a settled view on this, is um, if the land is in the name of the church but the school is funding it, um, like we saw in the Mullock Fard case. The question arises of whether the school has an equitable ownership in that land. Mm. So, for example, is a leasehold interest over the land enough? Um, we'd question if it's a, an, a, an appropriate discharge of the governance duties of the school governors in agreeing to buy the property in the name of the church. Mm. But again, this depends entirely on the facts on the facts of the case. There is no clear-cut, cookie-cutter answer to that, I don't think. Uh, and look, you're right, Nina, and that was the... Um, that was a... a a substantial issue that was litigated in the equity division of the Supreme Court of New South Wales between the Malik School and the Islamic Council, mm. a religious body, about whether the school, uh, the, the religious body effectively held the land on trust of the school. Mm. That is, the, there was some constructive trust or other trust arrangement that was created by virtue of the funding coming for the acquisition of the land coming from the school. The court in that case was not persuaded that there, that there was that enough to establish a trust arrangement um, um, and the, um, the investment of the school was um, effectively uh, dealt with by long term right of occupancy uh, rather than the land being held for uh, on trust for them. Uh, but it didn't stop that having to be litigated in the Supreme Court of New South mm. Wales uh, for clarity to be developed. Uh, so again, the importance of reducing these arrangements to writing um, and the um, I had a I had another matter between a, uh, a school and a religious body uh, just in the last few weeks where similar arrangements had been entered into. Um, uh, the acquisition price was only a few million dollars uh, and now a, couple, a few decades later, the, uh, the unimproved land is worth uh, significantly more <laughs> uh, 
than the acquisition price. And I asked the question: if it was all to be sold tomorrow, um, who would who would the who would uh, who would expect to receive the money? Uh, and there was a bit of silence in response to that question, and that indicated to me that there was no real clarity about who really owned it. Mm. <laughs> um, so the importance uh, at an early stage uh, of um, some documentation, because documentation can help crystallise people's thinking about who owns it, who's paying for what, um, uh, and uh, what happens when things are sold, um, who gets the benefit and who doesn't. Great, thanks Andrew. Um, I've just got a couple more topics to touch on just in relation to leases and licences. I am conscious of the time, so I'll just go through them fairly quickly. Um, so what Andrew alluded to before is a new, well, last year's um, accounting standard. So Australian Accounting Standard 105.8. Um, this talks about income of not-for-profit entities. Um, and this particular accounting standard establishes principles for, the rec for recognising income of not-for-profits. It's issued by the Australian government. Um, so the purposes of this AASB is, um, as it relates to this presentation, is to establish principles for not-for-profit entities that apply to transactions where the consideration to acquire an asset is significantly less um, than fair value, principally to enable a not-for-profit entity to further its objectives. So for example, a church owning land and leasing it to a school for what we would call a peppercorn rent, so $10 a month or $10 a year, um, something very nominal. Peppercorn leases, um, the, the lease payments don't reflect the fair value of the property being leased. Um, and these arrangements typically occur in the not-for-profit space as well um, as the example I just illustrated. So where philanthropists as well want to grant a not-for-profit um, the right to use the premises as well. So one of the biggest impacts of this standard is that the assets subject to the peppercorn lease will be measured at their fair value and not just the value paid for them. So this, again, requires a market value. And the difference between the value of the land and the amount of rent actually paid by the school for the land will be capitalised on the balance sheet of the school as a credit to the income of the school. Um, now, I'm not an accountant, so that's probably where I'll stop on that point, um, and I'll move on to building funds if you've Unless yeah, there, there's there. also some corresponding expense uh, items that need to be uh, notionally taken up. Um, so it, it is going to have an impact um, not just on balance sheets um, but also in P&Ls uh, and it potentially is going to, um, for highly geared not-for-profits, um, potentially uh, play with um, some some ratios um, um, that that might be applied that you have to stay within uh, in terms of your lending criteria. Um, so look, if if you've got long term uh, leasehold interests, um, it is time for your finance committee to be talking to your external auditors about uh, or taking some advice, not from us. <laughs> uh, about how these uh, new accounting standards uh, might affect, uh, and it's not just if you've got peppercorn leases also, it's it's even if you've got market value leases um, or licences, how, how the changes in accounting standards might affect how you need to financially report these leases, lease and licence arrangements in your financial statements. Great. All right, on to building funds. Now, this is a bit of a sleeper that a lot of entities don't think about when they're striking these charitable entity arrangements, is that a lot of schools um, might have a building fund um, that's endorsed as a deductible gift recipient by the ATO. So any donors to the building fund of over $2 can be issued with a tax deductible receipt. Now, there's very specific guidance issued by the ATO about what the building fund monies can and cannot be used for. Um, and the use of this money, quite frankly, is going to be affected um, by the lease or licence arrangement with any entity that's not a school and isn't using that building um, as a school. So a quick rundown um, of the building fund requirements, and this is set out in the ATO tax rule in 2013 2. There has to be a school or a college, there has to be a building, um, and the big ticket item here is that the building has to be used as a school. Um, the use must be by a qualifying body and there has to be an acquisition, construction or maintenance of a building. 
All right, so the building has to be used as a school. Um, so there's very specific guidance about this and what it, the word for word what it says in the tax ruling is in order for a building to be used as a school building, its use must be substantial. A building will not be regarded as a school building where its non-school use is of such a kind, frequency or relative magnitude as to preclude the conclusion that the building has the character of a school building. So when we're characterising the building as one that's used as a school, obviously um, any other use cannot materially limit, detract or be incompatible with its use of a school. Now again, I don't have a cookie cutter uh, time or approach to say that this amount of time is, will tick the box and this amount of time won't. This has to be characterised on a case by case basis and also the interaction with the school of the outside entity. Um, so factors that will be relevant to determining whether the building is used as a school will include the amount of time that it's um, used as a school and the amount of time that it's put to not school use, to non-school use, sorry. Uh, the number of people involved in the school use of the building relative to the number of people involved in its non-school use. And I'm taking these directly from the tax ruling, by the way, so there's solid authority on this. Um, the physical area of the building that's put to school use re um, relative to the physical area put to the non-school use. Um, the extent to which the building has been adapted or modified in order to accommodate its school use or non-school use. And the other one is the school's ability to control the use of the building. So in summary, it does depend on how often the land or buildings are put to non-school use. Um, and that's probably all I've got on that one. Um, my, my take home would be that if you haven't, if you've got a school or college building fund and you haven't had a look at the 2013 ruling, um, uh, send us an email, we'll send you a link to it. Um, have a look at it. It has materially changed from the 1996 uh, ruling that predated it. Um, and so you, 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 you need to have had a look at it uh, and you, whoever uh, the governors of your school or college building fund uh, are need to have read the 2013 ruling. All right, great. We'll be touching on other commercial transactions um, and Andrew will be presenting on this bit. Um, right. I'll, I'll let you take it away. Great. We've only got a few minutes remaining, so uh, can we just go to the next slide? I've just pressed yep. the wrong button, <laughs> sure. uh, but uh, Nina will fix that. Thank you. Um, so I just want to touch on loan agreements, service agreements uh, and um, hire and other uh, use uh, arrangements. And I just want to cut straight through to um, some of the requirements to uh, which are really the practical tips um, to be aware of. Um, um, really, they need to be on arm's length terms. Um, you, you're a, once you start allowing school property or school facilities to be used by anyone other than uh, those directly connected with uh, with the school, they've got to be on arm's length commercial terms. Um, um, We've got to be asking ourselves the question, is the use of school property by someone else for the benefit of the school? Uh, well, if it's not in the advancement of the school's um, purpose of advancing education, it's really got to be uh, at market rates. Um, otherwise, it's, um, it's not for the benefit of the school. And even then, if it's at market rates, is that really for the benefit of the school when the school's not in the business of hiring or allowing the use of its facilities by others? So really, it's got to be um, use of facilities or assets that won't um, adversely affect uh, the ability of the school to use those uh, assets and facilities uh, and won't um, depreciate those uh, more quickly in a manner that would have an adverse effect uh, on the benefit for the school. Um, and so, it, 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 and when we're talking about the benefit of the school, we, we talk about that through the lens of whether um, it is advancing education um, through the school entity um, is, is really the test to be applied. Um, let's talk about some things to consider. Um, uh, if you've got loan arrangements, um, between, particularly between related entities, uh, be very careful of um, interest only uh, arrangements. If you've got interest only arrangements, they need to be for a very limited period of time. Um, um, just like for a very limited period of time. Um, um, just like if you go to a, 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 a 
they'd mainline bank and ask for an interest only loan, first of all, they'll they'll charge you more interest and secondly, they won't let, let you leave it on interest only forever. It'll only be for a limited period of time and then it'll have to go on to P&I terms, normally maximum 15 years. So we've got a question here. Um, uh, agreements for funding of building uh, the education revolution required community access at discounted rates. Oh, Jerry, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, that's a really good question, um, um, and and you are right. Um, I think the the argument there would be um, that the school received the government funding, block grant funding, uh, or BER funding or whatever it was, and one of the conditions attached to that funding was that certain community access had to be provided at discount rates. Um, um, therefore, uh, while the if the discounted rate provision was treated in isolation, it wouldn't be for the benefit of the school, but treated as a whole, it is for the benefit of the school because otherwise the school wouldn't have got the capital funding to build the buildings it built. So I, I, I think it's a holistic analysis um, as it always is in charity law, as it always is um, in the Department of Education or Non-State Schools Accreditation Board inquiry into whether an entity has been properly operating on a not-for-profit basis. Uh, the Malik litigation makes it very clear that it is a holistic uh, analysis. Um, so I think that's okay. Um, back to the slides. Um, the importance of documentation of agreements and arrangements and written evidence of market value. If you're relying upon um, arm's length market value terms um, for rent, license fees, um, labour hire um, uh, fees, services fees, you need written evidence from um, someone that actually knows what the market is uh, in that particular sphere uh, with some comparative data about um, how they've landed on that market value um, or some rationale which is consistent with what the industry would apply uh, in determining market value. Uh, set out. It's not enough just to get a short letter from an accountant with no um, uh, reasons and logic as to how the, uh, the number's been landed on. Um, and insurance arrangements, if we've got co-occupancy, um, we, uh, we need to um, think about who's insuring what. Um, one other thing to note, we're out of time, so I'm just going to very quickly mention these. Um, uh, the collapsing of PNF and sporting clubs into a single school entity uh, uh, helps to prevent the inter-entity relationship problems. Private benefit, um, um, if we've got arrangements with private entities that directors have an ownership, uh, directors of a school or college have an ownership or other financial interest in, We've got to be very careful uh, about the school not offending the non-distribution constraint, which is a requirement of it being a not-for-profit for charity law purposes. Um, uh, uh, and one, two final uh, pieces, two final observations. We're seeing increased regulatory activity in the education departments, particularly in New South Wales, uh, in inquiring into arrangements between churches and schools. Um, and we're seeing some of the adverse effects of litigation, of long-term litigation uh, and related entities becoming unaligned um, as uh, regulators start getting deeply involved and asking lots of questions uh, in these spheres. That's the end of the presentation. I'm sorry we've gone slightly over time. Thank you for your patience. Um, I just do want to give another couple of moments in case there is any final questions that anyone has.
while we give a, a minute or two for those to come through, I just want to bring your attention to the next uh, School Law webinar, which is going to be on the 3rd of August, and it's covering um, the legal aspects of managing a PR crisis. Uh, you can find a link on our website, um, so I'm not looking forward to that. That's the 3rd of August, and it's Friday at 10 a.m. All right, we've got a question coming through, so we'll just wait for that. Um, look, thanks very much for your attendance today. Um, all the previous web school or webinars, um, the recordings of those are on our website as well, and there's a bit of a library of those being established now. Um, it, it, it could be a source of uh, some resources for board training. Um, uh, for your boards, the slides are there with those recordings as well. Um, uh, would it be possible to remunerate board members and still adhere to the not-for-profit requirements? The answer to that is yes. Um, um, the uh, slightly longer answer is um, obviously that the remuneration needs to be within market bounds um, so that um, you don't offend the non-distribution constraint. Um, you've also got to be mindful about whether you have obtained a license from ASIC to remove limited from your name, which would normally require the non-remuneration of board members, so you will lose that right. You've also got to be mindful, of, which is that's called a special purpose company for a company limited by guarantee. You've also got to be mindful of fundraising regulations uh, in New South Wales, I think. Uh, um, I'd need to check. Um, there's a requirement that if you remunerate board members and you have a fundraising license in New South Wales, you need to notify um, the Office of Fair Trading in New South Wales of that. So there's a, there's a few little uh, barbs to be aware of, but it's possible. Well, we can't see any more questions coming through, so we're going to wrap up the webinar here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the recording is going to be made available partway through next week, and we're really looking forward to speaking to you on the 3rd of August, um, Friday, to talk about legal aspects of the PR crisis. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks to both of our presenters, Andrew and Nina. And